Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our board members, uh, the Chief Constable and all of the senior team who have joined us today for this live stream of the Policing Board meeting. Uh, I would like to welcome our new Chief Executive, Sinead Simpson, uh, who took up her position on Monday of this week. And I'd also like to place on record the board's appreciation to Amanda Stewart, the outgoing uh, Chief Executive who has taken up uh, her position uh, this week. Uh, as well, and we wish her well for the future. Um, we thank Amanda for her work over the last five years, uh, and uh, I'm sure she will she will take lots of the brilliant experience that she's gained here to the probation board. Wish wish you well, Amanda. Um, also, want to record on behalf of the board our thanks to the Director General of the National Crime Agency, um, who has announced her decision to retire on medical grounds. Uh, and her position has been uh, filled again this week on a temporary basis. Uh, Lynn uh, Owens, Lynn was a, a consummate professional who worked tirelessly to protect the community from criminality, locally, nationally and internationally. And we trust that all goes well with her treatment and wish her and her family all the best for the future. Um, Chief Constable, uh, in terms of recruitment, we thank you, well, in terms of everything, we thank you for your report today, but specifically around recruitment, we note that you've been advertising a wide range of jobs over the last number of weeks, uh, and we'll be starting the next officer recruitment campaign at the beginning of November. Uh, members of the Resources Committee have already had detailed briefing on measures being taken to increase awareness and representativeness, and I know that within your senior team today, you have a number who are very closely associated with that uh, upcoming campaign. As a board, we want policing to be a career of choice for all across our community and to have a service that represents the diversity of the community. So we very much support the range of measures to increase awareness of the roles available and also to encourage those who may not have previously considered a job in policing to take a closer look. And that's something I'd encourage not just board members, but those watching online, those of the media, others to, to, to get that message out there. There is a good career opportunity in policing. We want to see people from all backgrounds uh, um, apply and, uh, and become part of our police service here in Northern Ireland. Uh, the board will be uh, commencing recruitment process for three new assistant chief officer positions over the next little while, uh, and the recruitment uh, uh, of the new assistant chief constables, which will be early 2022 to coincide with the completion of the current strategic command course. Um, we've seen lots on the news uh, in the last while around serious issues in relation to policing confidence and indeed misconduct by uh, serving police officers, not within PSNI exclusively, but right across the board, specifically the case around uh, Sarah Everard and indeed the recent announcements around a number of misconduct uh, uh, charges that are being taken forward within the PSNI. So there will be quite a few questions on that subject, but on a whole wider range of subjects as well. But before we get to those, Chief Constable, if you would like to just make a few remarks from your report. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for the introduction. I also uh, echo some of your initial comments. A, a huge thank you to Amanda, both personally and organisationally, for all the uh, support, counsel and endurance uh, of the last few years. Um, and some of us obviously know you better than others, and welcome to, to Sinead. Similarly, um, I'd echo your comments, Chair, about how Lynn Owens will be missed. She's been a strong advocate and supporter of policing and tackling organised crime here. Um, and obviously we wish her well in a course of medical treatment. Um, I've also uh, a chance here today to introduce probably a, a broader sort of collection of senior people uh, as the team changes. So we've got Will Young here for the first time and, and Melanie Jones, who's uh, acting Assistant Chief Constable uh, as well, to help give some of their perspectives on issues that doubtless will crop up. Um, I obviously present the report to you today in its in its totality, but probably use my opening comments to take one theme out of it, which was actually already in there. But obviously, sadly, we've been overtaken by recent events in London. Uh, and I, I suppose we would all share sort of our horror at the horrific murder of Sarah Everard and the events of last week, which then unfolded in the public space. I suppose on reflection, which we've already given a lot of consideration and thought to in the last few days, I suppose it's remembering that the debate around policing here often focuses on, on, on the issues that fall out of the past and the society emerging from conflict. But I don't think anyone doubts that Sarah's murder and that of other women across the UK and much closer to home 
has brought a sharp focus the unaccepted reality that impacts women and girls from all communities in the here and now. Whilst the police service has a wide range of obligations, we know that women and girls are disproportionately the victims of crime. And so preventing violence against women and girls across all of our communities in Northern Ireland remains a top priority for us. I want to leave absolutely no doubt, both to yourselves uh, as our accountability body and beyond, that we will be exemplars of great service in this regard, set high standards and be advocates of wider change in society. We obviously have an obligation to make sure that leadership is matched through words and deeds. And I want to give an unequivocal commitment to you today from all of us that the police service stands ready to play its part in addressing these issues. We do understand the damage and hurt that has been caused to trust and confidence in policing, it has to be said across the UK as the results of the horrible actions of a serving police officer. I know from speaking to my own officers and staff of the sheer anger, frustration and upset at what happened to Sarah and of the impact it's had on how the public views their police service. For me and anyone that's chosen a career, we'll touch on this doubtless today, that seeks to help and protect their local community, it goes against everything that we stand for. So I'm glad to have the opportunity today, Chair, to share with you some of the developments about our forthcoming action plan in relation to uh, how we will consider it improvements in tackling violence against women and girls, which we hope to have ready in the near future. But also we want to look inwards into the organisation and look at a thorough review of our own internal processes to make sure we're doing everything we can to provide confidence and reassurance to women and girls across Northern Ireland. In addition to the publication of a comprehensive strategy, I've taken the step of asking uh, Pamela and Mark, based on their experience and talents, to lead a thorough review to encompass our operational approach, as well as uh, what we're doing internally. Part of this will involve Mark looking at an application of the key checks and balances, such as vetting, whistleblowing and standard setting, to make sure that we attain the high standards as well as ensuring our values and behaviours consistently reflect what we will see in our refreshed code of ethics, which will be due for publication soon. As I previously mentioned, I think the first stage in our process is to listen and we'll undertake a significant programme of engagement and consultation with advocacy groups and women and girls across Northern Ireland and our own staff associations to hear their views directly and ensure they have the confidence now as we move forward. I think it's important we take time to get this right. So this will be a marathon and not a sprint where we can make quick progress. Obviously, we will, because that's in the public interest. But we want to take time and dedicate attention to this important issue. We will share our wider thinking and determination and the path ahead. And in doing so, we welcome your constructive challenge and support in equal measure. I suppose there's many other issues in today's report, which we'll turn to in detail. Uh, but I, I, I think it's important in the introduction just to focus on my comments. So in concluding, I want to finish with where we started. I want women and girls on our streets and in our homes to be safe and feel safe. And I want officers and staff from our diverse rates and backgrounds and experience to know we care, we listen, and we will take action to ensure they enjoy the dignity, respect and comfort at work we should all expect in a modern, progressive and inclusive organisation. For any women and girls listening to these remarks, I want to let them know that we share their horror about the murder of Sarah Everard and we understand the hurt and damage that has been caused to their trust in the police. We're committed to listening and we will do whatever we take, what we can to make this right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Constable. And we will go straight into questions and start with the, uh, the Sarah Everard and sexual exploitation issues uh, and I'm going to ask Michael uh, to kick off with the questioning in the room and then we'll go to Liz online. So Michael Atkinson. Uh, Chief Constable, good afternoon. Thanks very much for the report and indeed some of your introductory comments will, will touch on some of the questions I'm about to ask you. Um, in light of the truly shocking revelations emerging around the, the, the murder of Sever Everard by Wayne Cousins and the matters arising around the Met failings, particularly around the pre-appointment process, and indeed, while employed, the ongoing monitoring issues that, that didn't appear to work. My question really is the extent to which you could enlighten us today, even at a summary level, 
on how the PSNI currently acts to pre prevent the appointment of rogue officers through the upfront vetting, how the ongoing monitoring uh, arrangements work to identify the potential emergence of rogue officers, and indeed the extent to which you would use or see whistleblowing or other ways of internally confiding information, perhaps on an anonymous basis, as a way to address potential issues internally within the organisation, and indeed any further measures, which I believe you have possibly touched on already, that you're planning to take by way of mitigation to ensure that similar events don't take place in the future. Thank you. Well, there's an awful lot of debate about this at the moment, Michael, and quite rightly so. I think you touched on a number of issues. Um, firstly, we've, we've got to look at how we bring people into the organisation, uh, both as new recruits, sometimes, although not frequently, as transferees. Um, I think that that was particularly relevant to my understanding of the Wayne Cousins case. And also to put the framework of policy and practice in to make sure that people can call out when standards fall and, and things are just plain wrong. Um, Mark has again been doing a lot of work in this space recently, so I'll, I'll bring him in, but we, we have done a lot of work to catch up in the vetting space, because I know there's been an issue uh, in the ball, which I'm sure he'll touch on in a minute. We do have a whistleblowing line and framework, but clearly this is about, I suppose, us all being part of setting standards and being able to challenge anything that goes from a, a, an unwelcome remark in the endo right up to inappropriate behaviour and indeed you know, acts that would, would transgress somebody's personal space or, or worse than that. So I think I, I've been really sort of pleased over the last few days, even in our own debates, but also the support from staff associations and networks that represent the various parts of the organisation about their determination to support us in tackling this issue head on. But do you want to give a bit more detail on vetting and things like that? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so all prospective student officers and all staff who enter the police service in Northern Ireland are subject to vetting before they join the organisation. Um, this is this is in line with national standards from the College of Policing approved professional practice for vetting. Um, it includes extensive checks of police systems for criminal records, criminal intelligence uh, locally, and also the national policing systems, the police national computer, police national database. Uh, we also do open source material uh, examination for social media, uh, and we also do a national security check. So those systems are, are in place to try and, and address as much as we can uh, the bona fides of people joining the organisation. Um, Vetting then can be reviewed at any time for any person. There are a number of stages of vetting, um, uh, but the Her Majesty Inspector of Castabrian Fire and Rescue uh, a few years ago uh, indicated that the best practice is that all people should be re-vetted within the first 10 years of their service. Um, so all the police services around the UK have been trying to catch up and deal with that because routinely in-service vetting wasn't happening uh, for every single person. Now there are a number of there are thousands of people in the service who are routinely vetted because they, they go through na the national security development vetting or security clearance vetting in addition to joining the service for, for specific roles. Um, but we've now been, we've now worked through this process of vetting all the police officers who haven't been subject to development vetting or haven't been subject to security vetting since they joined. And that was around 1,750 people. Um, we're down to the last nearly 600 of those. Um, uh, of which half have commenced and the other half will be commenced by the end of November. And it's through that process and we're trying to identify uh, whether or not there are extant issues with officers that we then have to deal with through either further investigations, ethical interviews or other matters. Um, and those are ongoing. Now, we have confidential reporting lines. We also have Crime Stoppers. Um, we, gen we, we get regular pieces of intelligence documents about officer conduct uh, through your anti-corruption unit, uh, who will have his own intelligence cell, then we'll assess um, and try and uh, verify and necessary investigations that are commenced as a result of that. And you know, we do carry out, as we do against members of the public who are committing crime, we carry out covert and overt operations against police officers who we suspect may be involved in uh, corrupt um, or criminal activity. Uh, and we will deploy all the techniques that we will deploy against any other criminal to try and catch those officers. Uh, so that is all already in place and has been for a long time, <coughs> alongside a whistleblowing policy. Um, now, obviously, the scale of that isn't as big as we would use against volume crime for the public, but it's there and uh, that, that, that's ongoing. But we're going to look at this again and we're looking at the performance of our professional standards. Uh, I think what the Sarah Everard case um, 
has shown is that uh, you know, we can't afford any degree of complacency around business as usual, that we must assure, satisfy ourselves and therefore the public that everything is being done uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, and, and that's the commitment that we have been made in the past, but we want to keep, we want to, we want to keep making. So betting um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, um, a very prominent issue in the service. Um, it raises issues, it will raise issues uh, with us that we have to deal with. Um, but it's just to assure the board that you know we're not sitting on our hands in terms of that. Sorry, the only the only follow up, and you have touched on it around the, the whistleblowing policy. Um, for me, anyway, would be just the extent to which police officers or staff working in the organisation feel that there's a there are arrangements there that would allow them to voice or raise concerns without fear of reprisals. And to me, it's just very important that that, that side of the process is tested well as as much as anything Mark. yes and the processes are there and these are matters that have been previous years have been raised by the audit office and also through public life um, about whistleblowing policy so we've worked on this and developed over a number of years i suppose the extant question is the confidence of the workforce have in those policies um and you know there are matters that are raised by people that we look at and you know are maybe not substantiated and therefore people may not see an outcome to them particularly if it's been confidentially raised i mean um but there are also other whistleblowing matters that are subject to very extensive investigation. And, and we try to comply with um, uh, public sector policy and guidance in this regard, and not just, not just police service guidance in this regard as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Liz, uh, some further questioning on this online. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, Mark, for your answer so far. Um, Mark, I suppose in relation to this and in light of the horrendous um, details as we heard from Sarah Everard's murder um, and the conviction of that serving police officer Wayne Cousins. I suppose I'd like to know a wee bit more about what steps PS and I will now take um, in relation to this, especially when we hear around that there are currently 39 officers um, being investigated for complaints of, of sexual misconduct over the last five years. I mean, you know, certainly what, what you've talked about there in terms of it is, is very important. Um, but I would like to see a focus in terms of prevention. Um, and I do would have concerns that, you know, this will, when we see what someone in a position of trust is capable of, that's going to um, have effect on public confidence. And, and I know that's going to be a challenge. So it's just to try and get a wee bit more information on what steps face and I when I take in relation to this to try and improve confidence and ensure that there are robust measures in place um, to try and prevent something like this happening. Yeah, and uh, you know, I I think I speak for <laughs> the police service when I say, you know, when the events of last week unfolded and we saw the detail of what had happened, I think people were just horrified by it. I know I am, and uh, and I'm sure the public must just be truly horrified. And this sort of seed of doubt that it puts in people's minds is one that that uh, we'd have to deal with now. I think. As horrific as this issue is, it's a, it's a, I welcome the debate being raised about police officer conduct and about the abuse of authority. Um, we have instances here in Northern Ireland that are that are now that are in the public arena of officers abusing their authority for sexual purposes. Um, that can't be justified. I think we feel confident in the sense that when these matters are reported to us, that, these, that in conjunction with the police ombudsman's office, you know, arrests are carried out, investigations are carried out, and convictions can occur. I think whenever we did this, we've done a lot of soul searching on this this week, the question that I've asked is whether or not we're doing enough to prevent it, other than just telling police officers that this behavior is, un is unacceptable and unlawful. So no police officer should be under any illusion about what's lawful, what's acceptable, what's not, what's, what's proportionate, what's net, what's ethical. Should we know what I'm that? But the question for us is to do more. So um, in asking for, I'm asking my team to look at whether or not our misconduct procedures are robust enough, and we've asked them to do that, and we'll work with the DOJ around that. In asking my team to look at whether or not the sanction guidance for panels is robust enough, we've also asked ourselves about the question about, well, what can we be doing to prevent these, prevent officers? Uh, and that's about the cultural piece about how we as, as colleagues prevent it happening, and also how we make this a more hostile space for people to stop these offences occurring, not just then how people like me direct responses when, when we know it has occurred. And uh, so I've asked for that work to, to commence. 
nationally as well. I mean, the chief constables across the UK are all looking into this, this issue in the same way that our chief constable is, because this is a problem that affects not just police service in Northern Ireland or the Metropolitan Police, but affects policing and affects public life about where people abuse their, their, their office. So we will be working closely with the, our national colleagues as well around lessons learned out of all of the issues that are being ventilated in the public arena at the minute uh, and making sure that alongside them and also through the inspection regime from HMIC that those are being followed up. And you know, we'll hope to come back to the board you know, uh, in the future with what we've found uh, and what progress we think we can make on this. Sure, just in follow up to that and thank Mark for his response. I mean, Obviously, as I said, it, there will be issues around confidence and things, and that's not just for the PSNI, it's, it's, it's right across the board. I suppose just on the wider question then of violence against women, um, you know, what, what are the PSNI doing in relation to support for complainants, victims and for witnesses um, from the time of, of an initial complaint in relation to this? So I'll ask my colleague Melanie to come in just to confirm to uh, Public. The National Police Chief Council issued a violence against women and girls strategy, which is due for sign off uh, in the next number of weeks. Uh, we have that strategy. We are now developing our own action plan specific to that, uh, to, the, to the, the entire issue of violence against women and girls. But maybe, Melanie, if you want to comment specifically on support for victims and our outreach and engagement. Yeah, um, as the Deputy Chief Constable said, um, we are developing the strategy. As part of that development, we've already had a comprehensive engagement workshop, which allows us to understand all the different groups and stakeholders that are currently providing support, so we understand this landscape. In addition to that, we've recently had the introduction of the Domestic Violence Advocates Scheme, which provides some really good support, and the early feedback on that is it's been particularly valuable. There is also the introduction of the Sexual Offences Legal Advisors, which support specifically victims of sexual abuse to understand the legal framework that the investigative process um, is going through and helps those victims. And then we're fully engaged with the current review of the Victim and Witness Care Unit and how that um, has an ambition to reach out and support victims from the time of crime reporting rather than um, at the time that court proceedings start. So there are a range of different initiatives to support victims, specifically victims who are um, females, um, and all of those will be part of that overarching strategy moving forward. Thank you. Just checking with John, because I know he'd asked a question. Are you happy to go on or would you like that? Yeah, okay, John Blair. The chair, chair, it's been referenced and, and rightly so that the, the murder of Sir Everard caused shock uh, and indeed great shock, so too should be said that some of the outworkings in relation to the policing of this and particularly commentary from the Metropolitan Police um, in, in recent times. So in addition to the questions that have been asked and the answers given already, um, I take reassurance from some of the actions that have been, um, uh, that are underway, but have to ask to give clarification and hopefully some further reassurance around some of the statistics we've seen uh, about PSNI in recent days, of the 39 police officers who have been uh, accused of sexual misconduct in the last number of years, how many of those 39 um, are still on duty and what action has been taken to, to monitor that going forward? Yeah, so John, obviously that, that, those figures span a period. Um, and I can't give you the details just now about many of those 39 on duty. Obviously, there was four of them had uh, were, uh, were 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 uh, dismissed, or sorry, two were dismissed and two weren't. Um, we, that's in the public domain. But in current current cases, uh, we have six live cases that involve sexual conduct and seven domestic, um, which covers then twelve people who are uh, suspended for that. Uh, for around those, so there are other cases uh, which will include the cases that have a sexual element or a domestic violence element that the officers are repositioned uh, and not suspended. Um, those decisions are made against uh, the uh, allegations that are extant in the case, the recency of them, the availability of evidence and so forth. So suspension and a repositioning are precautionary acts, um, which I have to make a decision upon um, as part of our, of as part of the investigatory process. So, um, uh, and there's no blanket process around that. And indeed there's a, there's, there's a, there's a framework that must be, that must be uh, followed in doing so. But currently we would have, uh, eight officers of those 12 then who are, who are suspended specifically for sexual offences, yeah. 
Thank you. Going to move to the area of uh, representativeness and recruitment, and I'm going to ask Dolores to speak to this. So online, Dolores, please. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for your presentation so far. But um, obviously, there's a very worrying downward trend in the number of uh, Catholic recruits coming forward, but also there is a uh, concern around police civilian staff. And I, I just would be interested rather in seeing exactly what's happening across districts, uh, not COVID notwithstanding, in terms of reaching out to post-primary schools and to further ed education colleges to attract uh, more people from more diverse backgrounds into both police recruits and police civilian staff. Yeah, thanks, Lois. Uh, I think, um, obviously, we've got two key campaigns at the moment. One is for police staff, which is just closing and the one we'll be announcing uh, in a few weeks time around police officers. And integral uh, to that is about outreach into the community. So we'll do that in a number of ways through different forms of advertising, but also in relation to the role, particularly of neighborhood officers, but broadly police officers in the round in, in the forthcoming campaign to be role models and advocates. So we can provide more detail in due course, just what we have done and where we're going, because there'll be a lot of minutiae for the time we have available in this meeting but it does cover things like schools fe places of faith and other places where you expect people to, to want to hear from us but uh, and i know will is coordinate all of this on our behalf with mel thank you um going to uh, come to a related area and that is with regard to uh the, the those who are leaving the service and Ed edgar has a question on this front edgar <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> we have a number of announcements in recent months of senior police officers and civilian staff leaving the PSNI to pursue their careers in other police forces, including in Garda Shikana, Police Scotland and the Met. While we, of course, wish them well, taken together, this represents a significant talent drain for the PSNI. Can I ask the Chief Constable if there is routine provision for exit interviews with officers and staff who are leaving? Uh, and if so, are there lessons for either the PSNI or the policing board from this? Thank you, Edgar. Well, firstly, uh, I share your sentiments in wishing former colleagues well. Um, I think it's a, an interesting situation we find ourselves in because it wouldn't be untypical for a large organisation to see the churn of staff. So um, I think in relation to the people you're referring to, all of them have gone on to some form of promotion which is a reflection of the sort of broad range of experience you get here. You can then apply to other parts of, 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 of public work or, or, and so on. We do do run an exit interview process. Um, there is obviously a live debate at the moment, which the board is sort of itself exercised in, in terms of conditions and what is being done to attract and retain people. Uh, but also the flip side is, as many people leave, you bring in new talent and obviously Will and Pamela are evident of that absolutely and it's good to welcome to the team and see they've both been able to hit the ground running so we have to manage about loss of knowledge and experience but also i think what this organization does need is fresh thinking and fresh perspectives so there's a two sides to this coin i think our, our related question on both of these is most relate to to resilience of senior level uh, and that's around the, the the breadth and depth of experience in the senior ranks Acknowledge the, the tension between accelerating representativeness at one level at senior, in senior posts and ensuring that those appointed uh, have accrued significant breadth and depth of experience. Uh, I understand that the current competition for the chief superintendent uh, boards uh, will change the historical time served uh, re required for the superintendents to, uh, to compete. Uh, just to comment on that, Chief Constable, and, and to, I suppose, to ensure the board that people coming through that competition will go out with the necessary breadth of experience to, to deal with what are very significant duties of the grade. Yeah, thank Well, the, the, absolutely. The, they are important jobs. Uh, and I think the resilience question is a chance to pay tribute to people, not just in the room, but beyond who have sort of mobilised so well across the summer as people have been leaving uh, to continue to deliver a response to significant policing operations as well as the day-to-day -day challenges of policing as well as trying to build a, a, a more modern organisation. So we've seen that in all sorts of different ways. I actually think um, 
I think we have to move away from the time served sort of paradigm, really, because it doesn't always give you the answers. Clearly, big issues from policing in the past has shown the frailty of sometimes putting people into roles that they're not equipped to deal with. But I think it's about looking for the best in people. Mark and Pamela will be running the promotion process in a few weeks. We have a standard, but we have competencies which we, competencies which we will assess against. Uh, and I'm sure they will take that job seriously and diligently, because it's, but it's about getting the best out of people and trying to project forward and seeing their potential rather than just always about what they've done in the past. And we want to want to shift that emphasis because I, I do think we have no shortage of talent and our job is to see how we sort of find it, exploit it and, and bring it to the fore. But Will might want to just share some quick examples of the thinking we're doing to, to bring that talent to bear. Sure. Yeah. Dolores, just hold on one take. We'll hear from Will and then I'll, I'll bring you in. Thank you. So I suppose just to, to embed on that, I suppose um, in the early um, days in the organisation, I suppose one of the, the key conversations we've been having is this whole uh, um, area around developing a talent pathway within the organisation. So we recognise that there's a need to develop our talent internally. And that goes from the point of, of when a person is actually appointed newly into a post right through to their journey with a lot of, of, of wraparound support for them in terms of coaching, mentoring and ongoing development. So we don't get into that position where we're coming to a, a, a campaign where we don't have the, the applicants to apply, nor do they have the skills, knowledge and experience to do so. Okay, Dolores, uh, sorry thank, to bring you in. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, just Chair, can I welcome um, Acting Chief, uh, Chief Constable, or Deputy Chief Constable, or no, not even can I even talk about Assistant Chief Constable. Too many degrees and titles. Unfortunately, I'm Ellie Jones to the meeting. It's good to see a female face at the table. It's been a long time since we've had one. Um, but that raises the question around diversity uh, among senior ranks. And the Chief knows that I raised with him earlier that there had been previous moves by a former Chief Constable to have a cultural audit within the organisation, particularly in um, police civilian side. Uh, has the chief, the, this chief constable committed to having a similar interrogation of, of uh, the culture within his organisation? In short, we have, uh, Pamela can give a quick bit of detail from the, uh, the People Action Plan, Dolores. It's an explicit part of that. And it's also very relevant to the comments we've been making this afternoon about looking into the organisation in terms of making sure that it's an inclusive workspace for the other issues we've raised about inappropriate behaviours that, 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 that may be disturbing to people. But do you want to just give a few bits? I should say we have Pamela in the room every week uh, or every month, I should say, uh, and appreciate it. So we do have the female face, but I know Dolores's point is in relation to serving officers, which is a different matter. Uh, but anyway, Pamela. Thanks, Doug. Um, I'm, I've never been accused of being shy, so that's, I think I'm fine with that. Dolores, uh, the cultural audits are indeed part of the People Action Plan under the um, be, um, representatives and inclusive group. Um, I think our focus over particularly the past number of days is that whilst we will undertake those cultural audits, we want to get more richness and there's a consideration around how we engage with the whole of the workforce and how we take that forward. Um, Will has coined a phrase that has come in stronger together. You know, we have a lot of professional uh, minority representation groups across the organisation. And to make sure we understand the support that's available for everyone, um, it's about bringing those together. And to link it back to the earlier conversation about having the confidence to speak up. And when you do speak up, uh, knowing that you're going to be supported in doing that. So I think it touches on Mark's point around early intervention and prevention, uh, being to recognise uh, good behaviour, call it out and give people the confidence to call it out. And ultimately, um, if it is a breach of our policies, that there is that raising concern and whistleblowing policy, that's there. And you won't be surprised that I reviewed it against the Office Raising Concerns Policy as soon as I come in. So that, that has been done as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. We, uh, we have a question on community policing from Frank next, and then after that it will be Mike, who's got a question around the South Armour Review, but Frank first on community policing. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Chief Constable and, and team, can I just pick up on something that's just been said first before I get into the community and use my chance here. Have you got in place a contingency plan, a succession plan for the top team for all the senior officers sitting on a shelf so that if anything happens, you can take it down and implement it? You're nodding furiously there from the first part. 
Well, yeah, yes, in the sense that we've been wrestling with this in particular since the start of COVID. So one of our sort of, I don't even say this because it's attempt fate, but if one of us gets COVID and given the previous working relationships, we've tried really hard in terms of behaviours and work practice to make sure that we're not all together so that we wouldn't either infect each other or prior to the changes in, in some of the recent rules, actually all have to self-isolate. So, but, it, but actually some of the succession planning is A, respecting the role of the board in senior staff selection, but Mel is an example that where we've got a vacancy, we will look to people that we feel have the skills to fill that vacancy and she's here temporarily as part of the senior team. So there, there are chances to do that both in the police staff side and also in the, in the police officer side. So I'm quite confident that A, we have the people to fill that space and also Alan has been doing a lot of work in the command sense to make sure we have sufficient senior people trained to deal with the most complex operations, which in credit to him was something left largely in his lap in the COVID space. And we need to make sure that more people are available for support and to do that. Okay, now I come on to a question. Uh, um, community policing. We talked earlier or last year about moving the, the base from 7,000 to 7,500. That increase in 500 was going to be a lot of it was going to be community policing. Can you share with us the volume of community police that are out there today, where it's projected to get to in the next couple of years, and how there might be a rotation of duties or whatever to fill that gap. Yep, I'll bring Alan in to sort of share some of the work he's doing on the Neighbourhood Policing Board, actually. But suffice to say, we've met our first promise. Um, when Mark was in the previous role, we said we'd grow Neighbourhood Policing by an initial 400 officers. It's not, not always at the that top of the, uh, the, the the sort of um, the bottle, as it were, because people come and go, either they move to a new job or they get promoted, etc. But we are largely in that space of the extra officers, and we're seeing their, their work all around the country each day and have a huge amount of positive feedback about what they're doing. We are going to be at 7,100 officers at the end of the year. Beyond that is obviously within the gift of the government because we don't have a budget to move beyond that. So we've got to see, I doubt we'll get a lift in one go, who knows? Uh, well, obviously, Pamela's doing a lot of work around resource planning, we can touch on if you want, but probably bring Alan in to talk about the Neighbourhood Policing Board. Um, it is something we monitor um, well, effectively daily through District Policing Command, but uh, of the extra 400, it was an extra 400, which takes the numbers up to the region of 790, close to 800 in totality for neighborhood policing officers across Northern Ireland. Um, we're sitting regularly around 385, and that's just about internal transfers within the organization, people leaving the organization on retirement and, and other pieces. Um, we are, and we have been reporting to the Partnership Committee, uh, have a number of pilots to make sure that uh, that's maintained and improved. One of the things that I've been discussing with this board and, and Mark, as my predecessor before that, has been about direct entry uh, for student officers straight into neighborhood teams as part of their uh, probationary development. We, we, we did some small sampling around that. We've just gone for a bigger pilot study of that to make sure there's no um, disadvantage to the officers or indeed the general service around that. So substantial piece of work that we've been monitoring over the next six to 12 months is already in place and moving forward in that space as well. And then a piece that the chief, the deputy and the senior team and I will be discussing in due course as well in support of the neighborhood program work is the rebalancing if it's required around local policing teams and what the correct balance between local policing teams and neighborhood teams is uh, and how uh, and how our calls for service are divided in that space and then what ultimately the the size of neighborhood policing looks like beyond that uh, and for the clarity for board members that would be at least to where we are and also has the potential perhaps to get slightly bigger over time as well within our current resource pool and notwithstanding financial pressures which may or may not come our way so that's just a quick overview of where we are, uh, but I think um, that's been regularly updated through Dolores as chair of the partnership committee and other members in this room, and we continue that work. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to uh, supplement. Yes, Trevor. Supplement. Is that, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, let, listening to Frank's question, and I mean, and I'm very much supportive of seeing additional officers, but there seems to be a feeling in the ground with speaking to officers right across the board that you're also making changes. Which, which would concern me because they're saying, some of them we're speaking to are saying that some of those are going to be asked to respond to some of the response calls as well as part of that. So in essence, 
we're saying we're doubling the numbers, but we're not really if we're actually asking them to do a different role. So are, are we playing with numbers here or are we really serious about neighbourhood policing? So um, obviously the conversations that we would have is we are absolutely really serious about neighbourhood policing. As Alan's hinted at, what we've got to get right where we've moved from where we've been to maybe where we want to be in future when we exploit digital investment, choices about the public, about how they want to interact with us. Is there's two quick big questions to answer, Trevor. One is where do calls go? Um, because you wouldn't want to have any police officer near a Treble 9 call and not going simply because they've got a certain role or remit. And secondly, uh, who carries crime? Because that will also influence the structure of, of all the other bits of the organisation that go with it. And that you know, we, we are doing well at the moment in terms of call attendance and how we process crime. But I think that's the work that Alan's hinting at in the next 12, 18 months. And it also links to the wider work that Hamlet will start about the whole shape of the organisation. Well, it concerns me, and I mean, I suppose there's two different arguments, all of that, of course, but some of the officers who have cho chosen to go to neighbourhood want to go to neighbourhood. They don't see themselves as response officers. So, and I mean, some of the early conversations I'm having with people right across the, the piece are saying, this is maybe not for me anymore. So we're talking about people leaving other parts of the organisation. Mm -hmm. I would be concerned that these changes could force good neighbourhood officers to leave the organisation and ask to go to another part because it's actually not the role that they have put themselves forward for. Yeah, I accept the point you're making and again, bring, 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 bring Alan in. I mean, I, and then I, so I enjoy going out with neighbourhood teams a lot myself and it, there is that sense of commitment, settling things down. Some of the COVID responses have moved teams around for various reasons, but I, I know Alan wants to just provide a bit more detail to uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, excuse me. Thanks, Trevor. So, no, absolutely not playing with numbers around this. Um, I think sometimes uh, a number of officers assume that neighbourhood teams don't do any calls for service. Uh, there, there's always been there's always been a certain amount of that business conducted through neighbourhood teams, particularly when we identify that those are local local issues that people are reporting about local concerns and local problems best dealt with by their local team, and sending the, sending a response team to that to then have to have a neighbourhood follow up team is probably neither, well, it isn't efficient and it's not effective either. What I am seeking to do, and, and, and I've discussed with members of this, of, of the partnership committee and members of this board over a number of years, is about how we manage abstraction policy. And sometimes that's almost the playing by numbers by stealth. So what we're trying to do with a conversation with the senior team, with the neighborhood policing board, is to put that on a firm footing about which of those calls for service are absolutely appropriate, that, that, the, first, that the first piece of service delivery should be through the neighborhood teams. Um, to make sure that they're not getting distracted off into things that would more properly be done by response or local policing teams. I understand that internally, as you try to refine that, people will have different views and there will be different conversations arising out of it. But from a strategic view, from a view from this policing board, the intent is only that we use neighbourhood policing teams in line with any calls for service that are absolutely aligned to the core function about deal local police dealing with local people solving local problems. And if we can do that at the first call, uh, without having to involve other parts of the organisation, that's both an effective and efficient way to do that. And will that be absolutely transparent around what we're doing? And that will be absolutely transparent and putting back to this board on. Thank you. Uh, we'll move along. Uh, Mike on South Armagh, and then I'll come to Morris on MOT and Linda on Mother and Baby uh, report. But firstly, Mike. Thank you, Chair. And I, I understand that compared to the, the implications of the Sarah Everard murder, this is a, a perceived as a step change down in significance, but I think it's important to better understand um, how the PSNI engages with third parties. Chief Constable, at, at the end of last month, you, you gave us two written answers with regard to how the consultation was conducted. Uh, and in the first, you said that um, the four main churches were contacted in writing and one responded. So the question is, why was there no follow up with the other three? Uh, to my understanding, that there was follow-up through the, uh, the stakeholder and consultation group. There was a consultation strategy that was developed at the outset, which involved a wide range of uh, players, Mike, albeit recognising the geography. So stakeholders from the community, political representatives and the, uh, the community safety partnership. That then pushed into reach out to, in, in one regard, faith. Uh, I think a letter was written. We got one reply from one church, but I can double check this, but as far as I'm aware, there was a number of attempts to elicit reply and it just wasn't forthcoming. 
Right. It would have been useful if that had been in the written reply that there was a follow-up. The, the other issue is um, the survey that was conducted by Community Restorative Justice Ireland. And of course, you'll recognise some people considered engaging them in the first place to be controversial. Um, but you're saying that they generated 502 responses, but the results of the survey were not validated by the police service. So what was the point? Uh, well, I think it was just about get, getting an additional perspective. Uh, what, If you remember what we said last time, and some of it's referenced in the report, Mike, that when we went into that part of the country, we did, once we started looking at this in detail, find ourselves in a position where maybe compared to other parts of the country for various reasons, some of the internal things like a beat profile about key individual networks weren't as well developed as we might have seen in other places. So we had to reinvent how we had those conversations face to face, albeit in the COVID environment, and then get additional perspectives. So the, 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 I think the view of the report authors, which we accept to is largely, and you'll see the detail in the report, there were a lot of face to face interviews with people in the community and also with officers that work there that basically built up the body of evidence. And the view was that both in the PCSP, where you recall there were some constructive and positive comments about the behavior of officers, but also from that larger survey, that it broadly mirrored what we were finding out face to face and the themes were the same. Yep, Simon, I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't understand why, in a consultation and a, and a review, which you said was the biggest since Patton, that, that you've got this survey by an organization and it's not validated. So effectively it's worthless, is it not? Well, you're entitled to your opinion, Mike. I think what we did was a layers of evidence gathering. Uh, we looked at data, as you remember. We did a large number of face-to-face -face interviews, and they are set out largely where we went. And, and the survey data, when you saw some of the analysis, which is in the back of the report and the appendices, just showed themes about you know, how people viewed the police. And it was, it was layered to make the conclusions that were then brought to bear in the report. So I think we rehearsed last time the issue around how we looked at other methods of commissioning, uh, whether it was value for money to look at a, a broader polling service, which we discounted. Um, but I think it was looking uh, for all the commentary, the totality of the report, which was what was, what was what important to us. And we, we sort of then reviewed that as a senior team, took each recommendation in turn, as, as we said last month, and then gave our view about what would progress. So there was a lot of rigor applied to different parts of this. But remember, this was a small part of the country. Maybe if we'd been doing a survey for the whole of the country, we might have adopted other means in a, in a value for money and assurance per, uh, space. But this was about getting layers of information and making conclusions, which the report authors did, and then we reviewed as a senior team. Okay, thank you for that. Um, going to come to uh, Morris, who has a question on MOT, and then Linda, mother and baby report. Morris. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief, Chief Constable, for your appearance here. Uh, I'm sure you're, you're aware that MOT uh, has a lot of the, the, the headlines at the moment. So can, can you uh, assure motorists who, whose vehicles do not have an, a current MOT certificate that has expired and they're unable to get a test that they will not face prosecution? Uh, and have you had any discussions uh, with the Department for Infrastructure no. or insurers or other stakeholders to ensure that PSNA policy uh, takes into consideration that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hope you're not asking for a friend, but I'll, I'll, bring, uh, I'll bring Alan in. <laughs> Chair, um, Mars, um, I'm, I'm sort of doing this from the back of a hard drive here somewhere. Um, it's, it's not my direct air responsibility. Yes, is the answer to the question. Um, there have been discussions with the FI and ourselves through our Roads Policing Policy Branch, um, and there is an arrangement. Um, the good news is, I think, from what I'm seeing, both through my own uh, home circumstances and friends and family, uh, significantly more appointments available, and the backlog seems to be coming down quite quickly. So that, that's the problem is shrinking, which is a good thing. Um, people. Uh, there will have been people who are or who were on uh, have been given exemptions, but there is a gap in the middle between exemptions ending and being able to get new tests because of, because of the queues, and our the arrangements in place between ourselves and DFI 
are where the police officer is satisfied that it's a genuine case of not being able to obtain MOT services, then the police will not seek to take issue with that. Of course, in any gap in any system, there'll be people who try to use that as an excuse for their own feelings, and police officers remain the, to retain the discretion to deal with that accordingly. But honest people doing an honest thing for all the right reasons, I don't, won't have anything to fear in this space in the police force. Good to hear, given my car fits into that category. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you for the question, Morris. Okay, um, last few questions now. Uh, we're going to Linda first, then to Dolores on Legacy, and then to Trevor. And if there's anybody else, your supplement, Linda, is okay. We'll do it that way then. So Linda, then Trevor, then Dolores. Linda. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Chief Constable and staff. First of all, just to say that I, I was glad to see how quickly PSNA came out of the traps yesterday or in response to the um, independent panel report around the mother and baby. I think that it's very pertinent that we're discussing this because it is about abuse and violence against women and girls. And it links into what we're talking about today in, in relation to Sarah Everard. And I think if we don't learn from what happened in the past and we don't learn from what's happening currently, then it will happen again. And we can see that violence against women and girls is happening in different forms. So I think it is important to, to show some leadership and that has been shown in this circumstance. My question is what conversations have been had or do you intend to have with the Department of Health in relation to the protection of records because that is going to be crucial in terms of any cases brought forward but it is crucial obviously in, in any circumstances just for those victims and survivors and those who went through these institutions in terms of being able to access their own records, being able to gain their own information and being able to use that, whether it is for themselves and their own information or whether it is for a criminal case. Well, first of all, th thank you, Linda, for, for highlighting uh, this, it, you know, but for other events, it may be something we would have made more attention to um, today because um, clearly the inquiry report raised all sorts of very difficult questions. Um, I think first it's about paying tribute to Detective Chief Superintendent Anthony McNally, actually, because He's been doing a lot of the, uh, the groundbreaking work in relation to our action plan in, in, in the round against violence and intimidation against women and girls, and also sees quickly on this, which he dealt, dealt with Mark yesterday. I think our issue is about seeing potentially how those records will be evidence. Um, it may be that we can answer this more fulsome in a, in a written response rather than just going into headlines here, because we're literally in this early stages of dialogue with various government departments and other institutions, but I don't know whether you want to say anything more than that, Mark, as far as we can go. I think we'll just say that obviously Anthony has indicated we're commencing criminal inquiries and therefore we expect everybody who would have a record relevant to that to, to maintain that until we have a chance to um, examine it. Can Thank I, you, Trevor. Can I just simple. come in with... Oh, sorry, Linda, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, but a, a, a quick supplementary. I, it's, it's not actually a question, but a suggestion. There is an interdepartmental working group there on their health that it might be worth reaching out to to have a conversation with just in how best to reach victims and survivors because victims and survivors are part of that group. So I think that might be something worth looking at. But thank you. And am I right in saying there's a dedicated helpline? Yes. Thank you very much. Trevor. Um, related and loosely, and I suppose whilst what Linda's brought forward today is historic stuff, there's also the historic stuff that's been going on in the morning. I appreciate that the police are, are heavily committed in that. However, I suppose where I stand convinced in all of this, given the feelings in the one that we've just spoken about, given the feelings we already know in the Mucklemore space, really, what conversations are you having with the health minister, health department, about lessons learned from there? Because for me, it seems to be the service now being used to do some of the work to trust. I actually had this conversation at the command centre, I see with Alan. I mean, speaking again to local officers, much of their time is taken up by doing the job of the trust at that hospital. So for me, I'm not sure lessons have been learned from the trust. I think they've conveniently passed their work to the police service. So going forward, what conversations are you planning to try and change that culture within the hospital to actually get them to have their own robust systems, to fix it as opposed to policing it out? I mean, I, I, I can, you know, I mean, we've heard that Frequently, we would ask questions in, in the Antarctic area, why is the helicopter up? No sense because a vulnerable person has left the facility. 
for, for me, that says that the systems there are not robust and the police are a convenient excuse and, and, and the catch-all. I don't think it's an, an acceptable way to continue to go forward, given that these people are most, some of the most vulnerable people in our society who are there for their safekeeping, but it seems they're not actually very safe. Yeah, you raise a, a lot of very important issues there, Trevor, about protecting people equally who's best qualified to do things. And I think, again, we can probably spend a bit more time out of here sort of sharing our thinking, but there's a number of strands to it. Firstly, Pamela and I have started work across the Blue Light family about how we can cooperate and collaborate better, whether it's from call handling through to who's best equipped to deal with certain types of situations. That's in its early phases. Um, secondly, there are groups of people that can address some of these issues for us. So for example, Alan will do something around sort of general resilience. Um, there are safeguarding groups. There is the community safety partnerships where at a local level, um, these issues can be addressed. And I think um, as we get the outworkings of, of Muck and Moore and indeed um, the, the, the recent commentary, I, I would welcome that dialogue with the health minister. It's something I could probably speak offline about how we best we do that. Thank you. Um, final question uh, from Dolores on legacy. Dolores. Uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, it was just in relation to disclosure. I mean, there continue to be concerns raised with me in the timeliness of uh, disclosure from PSNI to other investigators. I, I just wonder what mechanisms or improvements has the chief made in relation to disclosure? Um, uh, and have there been any um, practices that have been adopted from, for example, Canova in, in relation to, um, the, to disclosure. And a, a tenuous link, Chair, but an important one. And, and the Chief Constable's report, he touches on organised crime, paramilitarism and drugs. I just say there's an important um, new tool in the kit, if you like, and is it Nexaplone in terms of something around the drug deaths? Just one of the Chief might say something about that because it is an ongoing concern. Yeah, I'll, st I'll start with that and work backwards, I guess, Dolores. Um, I think it's a welcome innovation. It's just started last month. I think there's been one deployment so far that obviously it's a drug that potentially can uh, support somebody who, who may be at risk of using, uh, losing their life because of drug misuse. I've seen some of the pressures firsthand, particularly in Belfast, that the local teams have been having to deal with because of uh, street level drug, drug dealing and drug taking. So I think that's something we'll watch with interest and it's something that Alan's been uh, overseeing through his neighbourhood policing group. Um, disclosure actually hits us in two places. Uh, Mel has been doing a lot of work in another part of her life to improve disclosure in real time, if you like, as part of the criminal justice approach, which we've seen some real improvements. But also Mark has been overseeing work about how we improve relationships with the Ombudsman and other parties when we've got long term historical inquiries to get access to the information that they need. But if you want more detail on what, we can give that to you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all of the members of the public and the press who have joined us for our public session today. The date of the next public meeting will be Thursday, the 4th of November, 21. Um, as it happens, it's a special anniversary. That will be the 20th anniversary uh, to the day since the establishment of the new policing arrangements uh, and the establishment of the board. Um, suffice to say that this room here has seen a lot of issues discussed over the last 20 years and we look forward to marking that milestone next month when we come together. So hopefully see you all then and thank you for joining us today. Bye.